Hi everyone, my name is Gemma, I'm one of the residents at the Pian Hospital and today I'd like to talk through um, falls in elderly. Here's the outline of our talk. We'll go through definition and the risk factors for falls, case studies, there will be five, investigation, management and some take-home messages. I'll make this talk um, as clinically relevant for you all as possible. So what is a fall? A fall is defined as an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or floor or other lower level. So I'd like to go through whether these six scenarios are a fall or not a fall. The first one, landing on the ground after tripping over a park carpet. That's definitely a fall. Found on the floor unwitnessed. And this is an unreliable historian and with no collateral. This is a fall. Lowers herself in very unsteady manner onto the floor, hitting both knees. The, unsteadin the, the unsteadiness warrants this as a fall. Slides onto the floor from the wheelchair. Not a fall. Found on the floor aren't witnessed, but the person is adamant that he was looking for his shoes and he is cognitively intact. This is not a fall. Slipped whilst mobilizing, but caught and lowered steadily by sun. Not a fall. So what are the risk factors for falls? There are a lot, but I'd like to draw your attention on a few, um, which you will encounter, you know, in ED or the wards. So if you're elderly or that you're female, you have previous history of falls, uh, history of stroke, unsteadiness, or dizziness on standing, so orthostatic hypotension, use of psychotropic medications, history of dementia or mild cognitive impairment, if you have imbalanced gait, such as Parkinson's disease, or that if you have lower limb issues. So let's start with case one. You're working after hours and respond to a clinical review for a fall. Bob, a 79-year-old male, admitted to hospital for treatment for urosepsis, who was found on the floor next to his bed. Nursing staff heard him cry out and a, th and a loud thud. His ops post fall are 150 on 80, 80 beats per minute, 36.7 degrees, rest rate is 20, and he's saturating 98% room air. How will you manage this clinical review? So, um, for any clinical reviews that you will see as an after hours, um, as an internal resident, you want to first make sure the patient is stable. You go through your ABCDs and then sense that, you know, his ops are within normal range and the nurses are there to look after him. Let's say that he is stable. Then you go on to history and find out what is the mechanism of his fall. You know, Bob is cognitively intact. He's a good historian. He tells you that his catheter got caught in the bed rail. Then you move on to clinical exam. And for any fall, I want you to know that you need to examine from head to toe. Um, so in this, what you would do is start with the head, look for any injuries, and say he didn't have any head strike. And you move on to the cranial nerves and then do a, a brief neuro exam of the upper and lower limbs. Then um, you need to uh, examine for any spinal injuries or joint um, injuries by feeling especially for the shoulders, the hips, the chest, the rib cages, um, the knees, and say that Bob has right knee abrasion and some hip pain. Then you'll follow on with investigations. In this case, his ops are stable and he's not febrile. And perhaps you only need just some imaging to rule out if there's a, a bad pelvic fracture. You can do a pelvic x-ray and a right knee x-ray. And, and then lastly, you can propose management. Um, for, for him, uh, the most likely cause contributing to his fall is um, having an external catheter. And hence, if there is no contraindications, you will probably recommend to the team for early trial of void, meaning taking out the catheter as soon as possible or that his infection settles. So we've touched um, extrinsic factors um, as cause for fall in this case. So what I'd like you to know is that fall secondary to walking aid malfunction, lines and catheters are very common. 
and reliable history can be obtained from someone who has no cognitive impairment or not in delirium, such as the case with Bob. Examination needs to be thorough and to look for wounds and bony injuries. And if you say can't clear of, you know, CT, um, of pelvic um, injuries, then you probably need to do some imaging. And lastly, CT brain is not indicated in an witness fall, save the patient's cognitive intact, didn't have any head strike, not on any anticoagulants. So moving on to case two. 72-year-old Carol is taken to hospital by son after she was found on the floor. Carol normally ambulates independently. Past medical history-wise, she has hypertension, reflux, and no falls. Medication, she's taking Herbisartan for hypertension and Isomeprazole for her reflux. Ops are within normal range. On further questioning, she said she felt slightly unwell and then blacked out. She does not remember how she felt or why she felt. What investigation would you do to find the cause of Carol's fall? So important things that you want to note in this history is she's she felt slightly unwell and blacked out, and she doesn't remember this event. So this points to you towards a possible cause or a precipitating event, such as a syncope that's leading to this fall. So to rule out a possible syncope event, we can do an ECG and say this is Carol's ECG. What can you see? There are three beats, so it's in sinus rhythm first, uh, followed by regular QRS, and then it disappears until the third strip where the, uh, it starts beating regularly again. So in total, this ECG demonstrates there is a prolonged sinus pause, which indicates a likely cause of her fall. So what investigations can you do to um, diagnose or rule out syncope? Um, syncope can be divided into cardiac, neural, or autonomic causes. For cardiac causes, as we've touched on, ECG is essential. Plus or minus two days of telemetry monitoring if you're really concerned from the history. Uh, this can be um, in addition to an echo and a halter monitor as an outpatient. Secondly, for neurally mediated syncope um, or vertebral bacillary insufficiency, you can consider a CT brain or CT angiogram. Thirdly, for autonomic causes, a postural blood pressure together with heart rate help you to see whether the patient is compensating when they say stand up really quickly with adequate increase in heart rate. Other than that, you can do your basic workup like a full blood count, EUC and CRP, plus or minus a chest x-ray. So as we've spoken about, um, the ECG findings suggestive of a cardiac related syncope um, can be divided into the heart blocks, such as the, um, oh sorry, the first is if they have inappropriate sinus bradycardia, say if they have symptoms of bradycardia when it's beating less than or equal to 40 beats per minute. And second, if they have any heart blocks like a sinus atrial node block, like a prolonged sinus pause over four seconds. If they have AV node blocks, like second degree or third degree heart block. Bundle branch blocks, um, either left bundle or right bundle, together with a left-sided vesicular block. And that by that, I mean either they have left axial deviation or right axial deviation on the ECG. And lastly, ischemic changes, QT interval changes, or ventricular tachyarrhythmias. The management for cardiac-related syncope include a pacemaker insertion, especially for the ECGs I've just mentioned above. These are definitive indications or if they already have a pre-existing pacemaker and then they had a syncope, you want to do a pacemaker check in hospital. Let's move on to the third case. 75 years old Edward comes to hospital with wife after an aunt winner's fall at home. This is on the background of Parkinson's disease. On exam, you notice typical resting tremor, stooped posture and bradykinesia. What are his risk factors for falls and how will you manage these risk factors? I've said before, gait instability due to, say, Parkinson's disease is a huge um, contributor to falls. And what are his risk factors? So I've grouped the risks of Parkinson's disease in terms of falls into three areas. First is gait imbalance. You can definitely see this on exam for 
people come with Parkinson's. They have a stoop posture. They can't rise well because of postural instability. And they have, when they start walking, they have reduced stride length. Um, they may have um, gait freezing, lead pipe rigidity when they turn. Um, yeah, and all this contributes to fall. And because of this, you can ask for a physiotherapist to review them and to look at the medication and see if there are optimal dose of dopamine agonists. The management um, include providing them with the best mobility aids, maybe an occupational therapist assessment to see what kind of aids is most adequate at home, exercise programs or physiotherapy at home, uh, neurology review uh, to optimize the medications, maybe increasing the frequency of the dopamine so they don't have an on or off effect when the dopamine wears out and they become bradykinesic. Secondly, they will experience orthostatic hypertension, and this is to, deal with, to do with the depletion of dopamine in their autonomic nervous system. Uh, you can detect this with the postural blood pressure and the heart rate, and they probably will have a greater than 20 millimeters of mercury drop in their systolic when they say stand up after one minute. The management um, can be divided into non-pharmacological, including TED stockings, and telling them to rise slowly from the bed or taking a gob of water when they rise. And pharmacologically include, say, fludrocortisone or midodrin, which has shown some slight evidence. And thirdly, um, there is dementia. So Parkinson's disease patients, um, over half at least, will um, have some cognitive impairment in the years to come. And I guess uh, to help to manage this aspect, because this is a huge risk for falls, uh, you may do some screening tests like standard MMS, MMSE. Uh, it's good to rule out whether the patient has dementia or not dementia. Mocker test um, can be used for patients who say have um, different language. Oh, my apologies. Mocha is also similar to standard MMSE, whereas RUDAS is the one where you can use for um, patients with, say, low education or um, culturally and linguistically diverse uh, backgrounds. Obtaining a collateral history is important to see the subacute decline in cognition, and you can follow this up with CT brain, MRI, or PET scan to actually diagnose, say, dementia from Parkinson's disease. Now, management, again, can be divided into non-pharmacological, like care support, a lot of education, patient support, and services at home. And pharmacological, including dinepazil, rivastigmine, like the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. Okay, moving on to case four. So 78-year-old Joanne from nursing home was brought in by ambulance following an on-witness fall. She was found sitting on the edge of a bed she herself has no recollection of the event. Past medical history include dementia, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, osteoarthritis, type 2 diabetes, and depression. Medication include herbicidin, dinepazil, aspirin, duloxetine, simvastatin, prazosin, amlodipine, tramadol, PRN endone, glipizide, norirapid, and lantus. How does Joanne's medication contribute to a risk of falls, and how will you rationalize the medication? So you probably know that I've purposely made So this is a very long list of the medication. And I just want to demonstrate to you the effect of polypharmacy. Polypharmacy is defined as five or more medications frequently in aged care um, population. So I've highlighted uh, different classes of medication with different colors. So let's first look at the epicytum, prazosin, and amlodipine. All of these are antihypertensives, which can lead to a drop in blood pressure, causing a fall. And the management is essentially eliminating unnecessary antihypertensives, especially if the patient, say, is not um, hypertensive and have a good management of blood pressure. Then you may consider first eliminating the central acting ones, such as prazosin, and then consider else other things. Second, there is duloxetine. Duloxetine is an SNRI that is, helps um, to treat uh, depression. 
And a lot of the antidepressants have an evidence for increased force risk and fractures. They can also be mildly sedating as well. And the management for this is to, well, first consider if the patient needs this medication by, say, doing a geriatric depression scale. And if they do, then perhaps consider switching from, say, an SNRI to an SSRI, which have less force risk, or to metazapine, which a lot of geriatric population uh, are on. Thirdly, we have tramadol and PRN endone. These are the analgesics. And um, a lot of the elderly population have been prescribed narcotics such as opioids, long-acting benzodiazepines, and gabinergics, which can exhibit a heavy sedative effect. And the management is really to consider whether they need these pain relief medications or not. If the patient is not in much pain, then you can consider taking out some of the PRN endo. And if they are on, a, say, a long-acting benzodiazepine or a long-acting tramadol or opioid, such as Tarjan, then you will consider tapering off these medications to um, minimize the withdrawal effect. Fourthly, we have these um, diabetic medication. Glipizide is a sulfonylurea, which can lead to hypoglycemia, and so can the Novorapid and the Lantus, which are insulins. So to minimize the risk of hypoglycemia that can lead to a fall, we can think about, say, replacing the uh, agents that have a greater hypoglycemic effect with the ones that have a milder uh, hypoglycemic effect. So say switching the glipizide to a metformin, for example, and also consider reducing the insulin dose if the patient has well-controlled sugar levels. And especially in the elderly patient, your aim is not really to have a BSL between five to eight, perhaps a bit higher so that they can, um, you can minimize the hypoglycemic events. Uh, this is just a flowchart from up to date, which helps you to think about how to reconcile medications and reduce polypharmacy. And um, I guess the general rule of thumb is, if you think this medication can be causing the side effects, say sedation, hypotension that is causing the fall, then you want to see the benefit of being on this medication versus the risks. So if you know, the benefit isn't to increase mortality or that the benefit won't be seen, say, in the next 10 to 20 years, then you might think about stopping this medication. Now, if you want to stop the medication like a long-acting benzodiazepine, then you just slowly taper it off rather than stopping it suddenly and then you might anticipate a lot of withdrawal effects. The last case, case five. 80 years old John from retirement village was brought in by son after unwitnessed fall with head strike. Past medical history include prostate cancer, post prostatectomy, atrial fibrillation. Medication included metoprolol and apixaban. In terms of the history, John was very inattentive and unable to recall events. He wasn't oriented to time or place. On exam, there were no neurological deficit. Past sounds were dual. There was some mild superputic tenderness. OBS include 150 on 90 in terms of blood pressure. Um, 80 beats per minute for heart rate. It was 38, hence febrile, 95, saturating 95% of room air, and a respirator of 20. CT brain showed a superficial scalp hematoma, but no intracranial pathology. Um, I just want to flag that the reason why we did a CT brain is because, you know, he had some head strike, it was unwitnessed fall, and he was on anticoagulants. So, for John, how would you further investigate the cause of his presentation? Now, the things that I would like you uh, to flag you in this history is that he was very inattentive, unable to recall events, and disoriented. Now, this sounds like delirium, um, and um, this the delirium is coupled with suprapubic tenderness and a fever. So what are you thinking here? This may be an acute medical illness or acute infection. And what I like to communicate is that infections can cause a lot of falls in the elderly. And John's fall is likely precipitated by an infection which has um, um, caused the delirium and the fever. Because there is suprapubic tenderness, um, you'll be thinking about ruling out a urinary tract infection with a bladder scan, urine dipstick, and urine microscopy, microscopy cold gen sensitivity. 
You also just want to rule out any other simple infections like a chest uh, infection with a chest x-ray or listen to the lungs. And you know you can look for any skin infection like cellulitis that is also very common in elderly. Now management includes you know targeting um, the infection that caused the fall and uh, addressing other risk factors for falls which have we have discussed before. So what have we covered through our cases? We first looked at the catheter case, which is an extrinsic risk factor for falls because there are environmental hazards and a restraint which we want to eliminate from the patients. We then looked at syncope as a precipitating cause. Uh, with the Parkinson's patient, um, the fall is due to intrinsic risk factors such as gait and balance impairment, as well as orthostatic hypertension. The next patient with polypharmacy, um, intrinsic risk factors is the dementia, and that can um, make the drugs maybe more overreactive, and also um, polypharmacy. And uh, lastly, the acute medical illness with the urinary tract infection, which can uh, cause a fall. The next three slides, including this one, is more just say for your long case um, or how you approach a patient on the ward who present with a fall. So briefly, um, you can read this in your own time. But briefly, in terms of the history, you want to know the five W's. What um, happened? Where was the fall? Where did it hit? When did it happen? How was the mechanisms like? And who was involved? So you can get a collateral. And about the fall, you want to know prior to the fall, any shortness of breath, dizziness, vertigo, chest pain, or have they been well, really? Um, and then you want to know if there's any heels, uh, head strike, any loss of consciousness, so that you have an idea if this is syncope or not. Did they have a long lie? Do you have to do a creatinine kinase to rule out, say, rhabdomyolysis? And what happens after the fall? Think about the footwear, the vision, and the walking aid, which are environmental, external, uh, factors causing the fall. We've spoken about whether they're feeling ill or not recently. There can be an acute medical illness causing the fall. And um, just to be comprehensive, you'd like to know the frequency and the mechanism of previous falls, just so that you know you might say um, do a osteoporosis screen um, to rule out why they're having all these recurrent falls. Exam-wise, you can do their weight, see if they're malnutrition or if they're obese. Visual acuity test, more just to see if they have any sensory deprivation causing a false. Cardiac exam, a neuro exam that we've discussed, and pay special attention to a lower limbs because that's usually where the money is in terms of the causes for falls. So look for edema, venous insufficiency, peripheral vascular disease, any deformities, say from arthritis, any sensation deprivation from diabetes, any proprioception um, or reflex deficits. And then look at their gait. Um, other than that, you can add in, say, a Dix Hall Pike if they have vertigo, and of course, look for any injuries. Investigations, as we've discussed, you um, can be selective, but in general, these are the ones that may be ordered for falls, including cognition exam like a standard MMSE or CAM for delirium, postural blood pressure and heart rate, blood tests, like a simple full blood count, EUC, um, CMP, CRP, plus or minus, you know, vitamin D, B12, folate, or thyroid function, just to look at their nutritional status. Do a urine to rule out if there's an infection, ECG to rule out any syncope, and you can do some x-rays to rule out if they have any bony injuries as well as a CT brain. Force management. This is good to talk about, especially if they have long cases. So you want to manage the intrinsic factors. Oh, I didn't put on the slide. So you want to treat any precipitating causes like infection or syncope. Then manage the intrinsic factors and the extrinsic factors. Intrinsic factors. You can optimize the chronic medical problems like Parkinson's disease, treat the cause, as we have discussed, like postural hypotension, rhythm problems or vertigo, and in the long term, optimize bone health with vitamin D supplementation and weight training. Um, and lastly, the pain management. Extrinsic factors, 
Look at the medications, ensure they're not you know, with polypharmacy. Improve the exercise tolerance by uh, linking them with exercise programs. An OT visit at the home to um, assess their environment as well as if they need any aids at home. Improve their vision or any sensory deprivation. Improve their nutrition and, of course, podiatry. So, take home messages. No fall is mechanical. So, please don't say that, um, I don't know, 89 year old Bob um, has fallen. Um, because of mechanical uh, reasons, because it's either intrinsic, extrinsic, or they have a precipitating factor, or all of these contributing to a fall. Ask for collateral history if it is an unwitnessed fall, or that the patient have neurocognitive issues. Examine from head to toe, and especially the lower limbs. Investigation-wise, do a urine dipstick, chest x-ray, Simple bloods, ECG, plus or minus a CT brain. And lastly, management often involves multidisciplinary care, exercise prevention program, deprescribing, and giving them appropriate walking aids. So thank you for listening. I hope you've learnt something that can help you for your internship and residency. Good luck with all your exams. And if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to email me.